Well, it's an honor and a privilege to serve in my grandfather's place today, and an honor uh, to get to tell you one story in the lives of the remarkable men that are seated here to my left. My grandfather likes to point out that he's a writer, not a raider, and in that spirit, I'd like you to know that I'm a reader, not a writer, or a raider. Okay? <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay. So that said, uh, I'll tell you the story of the historic air raid on Japan that these brave men conducted nearly 70 years ago. Of the 80 volunteers who came to be known as Doolittle's Tokyo Raiders, only five are still with us and four of them are with us here today. I know that this group does not need to be reminded of the attack by Japanese naval forces on Pearl Harbor on that fateful day and recall that more than 2,300 Americans were killed and a number of ships were sunk or damaged. And as we were all trying to recover from the shock of those losses, Wake Island fell, Guam was taken, American troops in the Philippines were being overwhelmed, and the remaining forces on Corregidor would have to surrender. Japanese troops invaded the Dutch East Indies and were headed for Australia. They had invaded Chinese coastal areas five years before and were pushing farther inland to attack the bases where the Flying Tigers were fighting for China. Never before had American morale been so low. We desperately needed some good news. President Roosevelt appealed to his top military leaders to find some way to strike back on the Japanese homeland as soon as possible. The alternative seemed to be that American bombers could be based in China or on Midway or in the Aleutians to make retaliatory strikes. Another possibility came from Navy Captain Francis S. Lowe a member of the, st of the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations. He had seen some Army bombers taking off from a Navy practice field near Norfolk, Virginia, and wondered if there were any Army bombers that might be able to take off from an aircraft carrier and strike Japan from the sea. The question was passed to Captain Donald B. Duncan, the staff's air officer, who thought one of four Army twin-engine bombers might qualify, the B-18, B-23, B-25, or B-26. The question was passed to General Hap Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Forces, who called on Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, famous air racing pilot and a reserve officer who had volunteered to return to active duty in 1940 because he was convinced that war was coming to the U.S. Doolittle agreed that the plane selected had to be able to take off from a carrier deck with a 2,000 pound bomb load and enough fuel to fly 2,000 miles. He decided that only the B-25 Mitchell could meet those specifications, provided they were modified to carry more fuel. He was given the task of having planes modified with additional fuel tanks, training the crews, and transferring them to the West Coast for loading aboard a new carrier named the USS Hornet by April 1st, 1942 was the deadline. Meanwhile, the Navy formed a two-part task force of 16 ships to transport the bombers within striking range of Japan. It was on April 18, 1942, that the news was flashed around the world. Tokyo and four other Japanese cities had been bombed by American planes. With one bold stroke, a sudden surprise attack by American bombers had proved that America could and would fight back. I have a short video that illustrates the unprecedented risk that Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and his 79 volunteers took on the day they made history seven decades ago. April 18, 1942. 16 B-25s, Mitchell medium bombers, sit on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea. Their mission, bomb Tokyo just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It had three real purposes. One purpose was to give the folks at home the first good news that we had had in World War II. It caused the Japanese to question their warlords. And from a tactical point of view, it caused the retention of aircraft in Japan for the defense of the home islands when we had no intentions of hitting them again seriously in the near future. Those airplanes would have been much more effective in the South Pacific where the war was going on. A Navy captain named Lowe 
conceived the idea of taking army medium bombers off of a Navy carrier and attacking Japan. The B-25 was selected because it was small, because it had the sufficient range to carry 2,000 pound bombs, 2,000 miles, and because it took off and handled very well. First, I found out what B-25 unit had had the most experience, and then went to that crew, that organization, and uh, called for volunteers. And the entire group, including the group commander, volunteered. The training was hard. No one had ever taken off a fully loaded B-25 in less than 500 feet. First, they had to prove it could be done. Then, they had to train the people to do it. Before they were through, one of the Mitchells would lift off in only 287 feet. The crews proved they were good, and so were their airplanes. The raid was carefully planned. Nothing was left to chance. Norton bomb sites were replaced by 20-cent improvised models to prevent the secret devices from falling into enemy hands. Doolittle then considered what to do if the task force was spotted by the Japanese. If we were intercepted by Japanese surface or aircraft, our aircraft would immediately leave the decks. If they were within range of Tokyo, they would go ahead and bomb Tokyo, even though they would run out of gasoline shortly thereafter. That was the worst thing we could think of. And uh, if we were not in range of Tokyo, uh, we would go back to Midway. If we were not in range of either Tokyo or Midway, we would permit our airplanes to be pushed overboard so the decks could be cleared for the use of the carrier's own, carrier Hornet's own aircraft. On the morning of April 18, 1942, the task force was sighted by Japanese patrol boats. The boats were quickly destroyed, but they could have transmitted a position report. It was eight hours before scheduled takeoff, an additional 400 miles to the target. Gas reserves would be dangerously low, but they were spotted and they would have to go. targets, turn in a general southerly direction, get out to sea as quickly as possible, and after being out of sight of land, turn and take a westerly course to China. We came in on the deck. We pulled up to about 1,500 feet to bomb in order to make sure that we weren't hit by the fragments of our own bomb. get the job done and get the heck out of there. The actual damage done by the raid was minimal. We were 16 airplanes, each carrying one ton of bomb. In later raids, General LeMay with his 20th Air Force sent out 500 planes on a mission, each carrying 10 tons of bomb. Reaching a safe haven after the raid wasn't easy. And because they had to take off much sooner than planned, they were very low on fuel. One crew went to Vladivostok. The other 15 of us proceeded until we got to the coast of China. 
When we got to China, two airplanes were so low on fuel that they landed in the surf alongside of, of the beach. Uh, two people were drowned, eight of them got ashore. The weather was quite bad, and uh, so we flew on till we got to where we thought we were as close as we could get to where we wanted to go, having been on dead reckoning for quite a while that we weren't precisely there, and then we all jumped. Eighty crew members flew in the Doolittle Raid. Sixty-four returned to fight again. They were part of a team recognized for its professionalism and heroism. A rich heritage remembered by a new generation of airmen. So that's the story told by the general himself. And uh, I'd like to point out that there is an inaccuracy in some of the footage in the newsreel when they show the B-25s flying in formation uh, that didn't happen. They took off, circled to set their compasses and went to their individual targets. Kept going all the way and beyond. To summarize the mission, those 16 bombers dropped their bombs on military targets and 15 of them very low on fuel because of their early takeoff 200 miles farther from Japan than planned were barely able to make the China coast as it was getting dark and the weather deteriorated. They were to home in on a radio beacon at a base in Chuchow, but no beacon had been installed. Each pilot had to make a command decision, continue on instruments and hope they could find a break in the clouds, ditch close to shore, or bail out when their fuel tanks were nearly empty. Eleven pilots, including Doolittle, elected to have their crews bail out over the mountains in the stormy darkness. The other four planes ditched offshore or crash landed near the beach. The 16th plane burned fuel excessively and the pilot, pilot elected to proceed to land on a field near Vladivostok, Russia, where he hoped the Russians would let him gas up and proceed on to China. But since Russia had declared its neutrality toward Japan, the crew was interned for 14 months, but finally escaped through Iran. Of the 75 men in the other planes, Two men drowned trying to swim to shore, and one died on the bailout. Eight men in two of the planes were captured by the Japanese. The Chinese were extremely helpful to the raiders, and thousands were killed by Japanese troops in retaliation for helping the Americans. Of the eight raiders captured by enemy troops, three were sentenced to death by a ceremonial firing squad after a mock trial held in the Japanese language. A fourth raider died of malnutrition while in prison. The other four were sentenced to life in prison and barely survived 40 months of starvation, beatings, and solitary confinement until they were released by American OSS troops in August of 1945. Although all of the B-25s were lost, the Doolittle Raid accomplished one of its main objectives, which was to shock the Japanese people psychologically. They suddenly found that their homeland was vulnerable to air attack despite what they had been told. The raid was a complete surprise and had been launched from an aircraft carrier, as they had done at Pearl Harbor. The military leaders were greatly humiliated and decided to change their strategy in the Pacific. They decided to attack Midway and thus extend their Pacific frontier closer to Hawaii and the United States. In June 1942, they sent a huge armada to the area and in the ensuing battles lost four carriers with all their planes and hundreds of personnel. After these embarrassing losses, the Japanese remained vengeful about the Doolittle Raid throughout the rest of the war. In desperation, they experimented and manufactured 9,000 bomb-carrying balloons and successfully launched more than 1,000 of them to take advantage of the high-altitude westerly winds across the Pacific and thus attack America directly. 285 of them landed in North America, but no severe damage was ever reported. However, five children and their teacher were killed in May 1945 when they found one of those bombs during a picnic in Oregon. They were the only American war casualties in the 48 states during the war. 61 Raiders survived World War II. A majority of them remained in the Air Force, and five of them, including their leader, became generals. There are now five of the original 80 Raiders living, and I want to introduce four of them to you now, I'll use their highest ranks held on active duty and introduce them in crew order. I'll ask each of them a question after, the, after I tell you something about them, and then uh, they're happy to answer your questions. 
First is Lieutenant Colonel Richard E. Cole, co-pilot on crew number one. <laughs> Staff Sergeant David J. Thatcher, engineer gunner on crew number seven. Major Thomas C. Griffin, navigator on crew number nine. And Lieutenant Colonel Edward J. Saylor, engineer on crew number 15. Although all of these men are forever remembered for flying on this unprecedented mission, the war was not over for them. None of them received any special assignments of any kind after the raid just because they were noted as one of the survivors. All raiders received the Distinguished Flying Cross for the Tokyo mission. After the raid, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole, born in Dayton, Ohio, remained in the CBI theater and flew many missions transporting supplies over the infamous hump route from India to China until June 1943. He returned to the States briefly and then volunteered to return to the CBI with the first air commandos in October 1943 until June 1944. He flew 250 classified night missions behind Japanese lines over Burma towing gliders with C-47s. He won two additional DFCs, two air medals, and a bronze star for these dangerous operations. After the war, he served in Japan. Later, three years as an operations advisor with the Venezuelan Air Force, and finally, a tour in California until retirement in 1967. Staff Sergeant Dave Thatcher, born in Bridger, Montana, returned overseas and served in England and North Africa as an engineer gunner where he received five air medals for his service during three major campaigns. Dave also received the Silver Star for taking care of his four injured crewmates and helping them evade the capture after the raid. He was on Ted Lawson's crew, which received acclaim from Lawson's book and the movie titled 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Dave's part was played by Robert Walker. He has lived in Missoula, Montana and served with the U.S. Postal Service until retirement. Major Tom Griffin, born in Green Bay, Wisconsin, was assigned to a new B-26 bomb group when he returned to the States and was assigned as a navigator with a unit in North Africa. He, sur he survived a ditching in the sea on one mission and bailed out on another when his plane was shot down. He was captured by the Germans on July 3, 1943 and was a POW until released in 1945. He was joined by three other Tokyo Raiders in prison who had also been captured he left active duty in 1945, became a CPA, and established his own accounting firm in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he still lives. Lieutenant Colonel Ed Saylor, born in Brusset, Montana, served throughout the rest of the war in enlisted status in aircraft maintenance assignments stateside, and received a reserve commission in October 1947. He is one of five raiders who were enlisted men at the time of the raid and retired as officers. He served in Labrador from 1953 to 1955 and was an exchange officer with the British RAF from 1961 to 1963. He remained on active duty until he retired in 1967 and he lives in Puyallup, Washington. The fifth survivor is Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Height, a native of Odell, Texas, who could not be with us at this time. He was the co-pilot on crew number 16, the last aircraft to take off from the carrier. He was one of the eight raiders captured, and he suffered torture, solitary confinement, and starvation by the Japanese for 40 months until released in August 1945. He remained in the Air Force for two years, went on inactive duty, but he was recalled in 1951 for the Korean War. He served in Japan, and then returned to inactive status in 1955. He currently lives in Nashville, Tennessee. So now that you know one of their stories, I'll let you hear them tell you some more. So I'll ask each of these guys a question, and, uh, and after that, uh, we're ready for, for your questions. So, Colonel Cole, as the co-pilot in the lead plane with Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle Flying, what were your thoughts as you prepared for takeoff? 
I, mainly, I was hoping that uh, we had done everything we could to keep the gentleman next, sitting next to me, happy. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a young pup, he was really wise. <laughs> See, uh, Major Griffin, after your bailout, you found the wreckage of your plane so that you could retrieve your uniform. Now, why did you do that? And do you still have this precious uniform? Well, it, it uh, was a wonderful find for me because I retrieved that suitcase of mine with my dress uniform in it and I was the best dressed Tokyo Raider in Europe, in, in Asia, for a couple of months. Quite a distinction at that time. Do you still have it, Tom? I still have that uniform, and it still fits me. <laughs> Staff Sergeant Thatcher, you were awarded the Silver Star for your actions saving the crew of your airplane after it ditched near an island off the China coast. Tell us about what you did. Well, after we crashed, uh, the other four crew, members of the crew were all thrown out through the nose of the airplane. I was in the back of the airplane and was able to get out. Then uh, that's, it was on a Japanese occupied island where we crashed and the there were no Japs there at the time, and the Chinese underground got us to safety. They, uh, four, four hours after we left that spot where we crashed, uh, they landed a, a group of Japanese soldiers that came looking for us. But we had already uh, started to cross the islands that they didn't catch up to. The other four of the crew were all so seriously injured that they couldn't walk, they had to be carried. So. We, we were very fortunate to have the Chinese help us. Great. I understand you didn't know the plane was flipped over until the tide yeah, went out. Yeah, the air, airplane was upside down when we got out of it. So, And uh, when I went back there the next morning to try to get first aid kits, I could see how much damage that had been done to the plane. Both engines were tore out, and the, the front of the airplane all the way back to the leading edge of the wing was smashed flat back to the leading edge of the wing. So if they hadn't been thrown out, they, they never got out alive, though. Silver Star. Colonel Saylor, just a couple of days before 16 planes were to leave the deck and commence the raid, you found a big problem with one of the engines on your plane. What did you do to ensure that it could take off and complete the raid? I was a, a crew chief and, and a flight engineer. I went everywhere with the airplane and done all the maintenance on it, the way it was done in those days. Um, partway across the ocean, my right engine developed a problem that had to be fixed if it was going to ever fly off the carrier. And it, was, it required uh, repairs that I wasn't experienced at. The, the engine normally would have gone to a depot for that sort of overhaul. And the general asked me if I could fix it. And I said, probably. Yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty strong, yeah. Um, and he said, well, if you can't fix it, we'll have to push it over the side. So we came very close to being a, a 15 airplane mission. Anyway, I had to take the engine off the airplane which was pretty tricky. The Navy helped me. They rigged up a hoist so I could hoist the engine. And we were the next to last airplane on the deck, and our tail end hung over the deck of the carrier. And when we took the engine off, the airplane tried to rear up in front and go down in the back end because of the change of the weight. And we had it well tied down, so it it stayed where it was supposed to, but it would have been a problem. So we had to take this engine that's over 2,000 pounds down to the hangar deck where I could work on it. 
and I had to disassemble the back half of the engine. And that was a job that I had never done and was not authorized to be done at the squadron level. I had some pretty good books with me and uh, got the engine off and took it down to the deck, hangar deck. I disassembled the back half of the engine and modified the, the uh, keys that held the gears on the accessory section so they wouldn't fall out anymore. These were the, the keys that held the planetary gear re reduction system and they ran all the accessories, distributors, magnetos, fuel pumps, or everything, ran off these gears. So, yeah, if one of those gears rode out a little farther on the shaft, it would have wrecked the engine. So there was, there's no way we could be sure that it would fly very far. So it worked out. I spent a few days taking the engine apart and <clears throat> getting the keys fixed a little better and putting it back together. And uh, it ran for the rest of the mission and, and it ran fine. We never had a chance to test top it or anything, but um, it, it did run, run fine. I had one particular problem on the deck of the carrier and the wind is blowing and every little part, nut, bolt or anything had to be put up inside the airplane or it would go overboard. And I had to remember where I put everything <laughs> <laughs> and, where it, and where it went on the airplane. <laughs> so I got away with that too. <laughs> <laughs> Had the uh, beacon arrived in Chuchao, so would have Colonel Saylor's airplane and all its parts. So what would you like to ask the Raiders? We have a microphone, if you just raise your hand. Uh, One in the back you. right here. Okay. Uh, once you hit Japan, um, I have read that uh, the AAA was pretty in in act ineffective uh, on your uh, airplanes, but were you jumped by any um, interceptors or, or uh, um, Japanese fighters as you were going over to Japan and as they were trying to leave? And if so, how did you avoid getting shot down given that your rear uh, guns were nothing more than broomsticks? Would you like to answer? Uh, I couldn't hear. Okay. <laughs> You'd like to know um, about uh, encounters with enemy aircraft over Japan, if you were intercepted, how you avoided interception, and especially with broomsticks in the tail. Uh, fortunately, uh, being in the first airplane, we arrived over Tokyo uh, shortly after they had a, had a, uh, an air raid exercise. They had a bomber called the Nell. It was a two-tailed deal, and uh, uh, quite a, I guess quite a few of the people on the ground thought that we were one of the air raid uh, thing. Uh, we were not jumped by fighters. Uh, we did count 38 airplanes above us, but uh, uh, again, we were not jumped. Uh, on the bombing run, we were a target of uh, uh, ACAC, which wasn't accurate. And so we got it in and bombed and back out unscathed. Another question? Uh, gentlemen, I'm uh, from San Francisco and I understand the um, Golden Gate Bridge Authority is still looking for the crew that flew under the Golden Gate Bridge on your way to uh, Alameda Naval Air Station. So. If any of you on that crew, I'd like you to fess up. <laughs> no, no uh, fessers? Go ahead. I can... <laughs> I just thought I might have a little bit to add about flying over uh, China itself. Uh, when we got there, 
we dropped down to rooftop level so it would be more difficult for their anti-aircraft to, to hit us. And we flew across China at, at that, and they were, they had some machine guns up on roofs and tall buildings that were shooting down at us as we flew down these streets. <laughs> and we, we made it a point to fly right over the emperor's build, uh, castle at about 50 feet. We had strict orders not to, to machine gun or bomb the, uh, the emperor's palace because that would be very poor propaganda on our part and, and only uh, knit the uh, Japanese uh, more seriously against us ever if we did that. But what we happened to do in our plane, we just happened to fly right over his, his house at 50 feet. And I, I think that worried the old boy quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, we, then uh, we flew uh, at rooftop level most of the time. It was much more difficult for them to hit us with their anti-aircraft. And they were shooting a lot of it all over the city, uh, mostly just uh, missing everything. But when we got down to the southwestern part of the city where our particular target was, which was a factory. Uh, we went across at about 50 feet and pulled up for our bombing run and succeeded in bombing. As we found out later, after the war, we bombed the factory right next to the one we were supposed to hit. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was World War II. We did a lot of that in World War II, <laughs> believe me. And uh, we, we did hit its immediate neighbor, which made uh, some kind of anti-aircraft equipment anyway, so it was a good secondary target for us. Tom, in, in one theater you, you bailed out in a B-25, and in another theater you bailed out in a B-26. Uh, was there any yeah, difference? I didn't want to discriminate against the different <laughs> Okay. You'll have to spot the folks with the microphones to... Molly, your question? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for your service. Part of what makes the story so extraordinary to me is that you were volunteers. This was a volunteer mission. So how did you hear about it and what made you want to be a part of it? I couldn't hear what the question. She's pleased that you were all volunteers, especially remarkable for this mission. She wondered how you heard about it and uh, chose to go on the mission. Okay. Yeah. Well, they called our group uh, from the from the uh, northwest, Oregon, where we were, down to uh, the Carolinas. And when we got there, uh, I just happened to be one of two men. Dave, uh, the other fellow was named Davy Jones. And uh, Davy Jones and I went up to Washington, D.C., and we worked with Air Force Intelligence uh, getting together the, the minutia of this raid, getting together the crews we were going to use and the targets we were going to hit. And we worked with uh, Air Force Intelligence in Washington for two weeks. Uh, it was a very secret mission, and we went into Air Force Intelligence. They put aside a couple of rooms for us there with the, our locks on the door, if this mission that we were going on got out to be a common co conversation, uh, we never would have made it. So it had to be very secret. And we got together in about 10 days all of the maps of uh, Japan and China that we were going to use for 16 planes and the exact uh, location of what we could use for a very profitable uh, targets when we got there. And we got all that together, went back down to Florida. Then as we flew out to uh, California to get on the carrier Hornet at San Francisco, we brought all of this information with us. And every day as we sailed across the Pacific, we had a meeting and each crew was assigned at least one specific target that they were going to uh, it was going to be their responsibility to bomb. And uh, the whole thing uh, worked out very well and very efficiently. Okay? 
Yeah, Ed, I think you had something to add to that, right? Ed, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, they say we volunteered, and that was true. We had no idea what we volunteered to do. <laughs> yeah. Which was probably a good thing. <laughs> They heard two words, secret and dangerous. Well, yeah. When we got to California, I don't know what the rest of the people knew, but I didn't know we were going on a carrier. We taxied down beside the aircraft carrier, and a big hoist lifted us up onto the carrier, and that's the first I knew that I was going to go on a carrier. Uh, I don't think very many people did, did know that. Anyway, those 16 airplanes took up the whole flight deck of the carrier, so I thought we were going to be transported somewhere that was too far to fly, and that made me feel all right for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and then a day or two later, we shuffled all the airplanes around and exposed about a 400-foot long runway for us, and that changed our thinking a little bit at that time. <laughs> And that was, it looked a whole lot like our practice in Florida, you know, so. Then we knew we were going to take off from the carrier. Shortly after that, they announced that we were going to bomb Japan. And that's, <clears throat> that's how it all started for me. You know. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I'm not quite, I'll, yeah. Right over here to the right. Um. What kind of boss was General Doolittle? Uh, what kind of boss was General Doolittle? Probably all would like to put you on that. <laughs> That's Dixon. He, he was a wonderful leader and a great airman. Dick, Dick Cole can tell you a lot about that. He sat next to him. Uh, well, for my part, um, he was a great person. He was a leader that led by example. Uh, he was very friendly. He called everybody by their first name. Uh, he was uh, highly educated. He got the first aeronautical engineer doctor's degree from MIT uh, in, in a business situation. He, he was all business. In a social situation, he was a lot of fun, and uh, we would have followed him anywhere. Super, thanks. I wonder if you could uh, tell us something about life with the Navy. How did the uh, how did you get along with the crew of the Hornet during your voyage west? Uh, at, at first. Uh, the Navy people weren't too happy because uh, they had a bunch of carpetbaggers with their airplanes uh, <laughs> all over the deck, and uh, that meant that their airplanes had to be down in the uh, below deck. And uh, also, uh, since there were 80 of us, uh, we had to sleep in the companionways and so forth. and. Uh, we just uh, upset their routine. But uh, uh, two days at sea, when they announced that this force is bound for Tokyo, uh, the attitude changed, and uh, they were gung-ho from there on, and we couldn't have been treated better. They treated, treated us pretty well. Uh, they, they, when we got on, or they, they uh, permitted us to sleep in the beds and they slept in the hammocks. <laughs> question right here. Over here. Um, this isn't a question, it's a comment. Uh, on the way over, I spent the night at Eglin Air Force Base, had dinner at the club, and I was talking to a couple of active duty guys, and they told me that uh, they went out and found the original airstrip where these guys trained. It was overgrown, they cleared it, and it is open to the public, so if anybody wants to go see, you can actually go see the strip 
where these guys train. That's Eglin Air Force Base in Fort Walton. You hear that? I couldn't hear that. Did you get that? They, they've, uh, they've uncovered and fixed up your old training runway at Eglin. So, would you like to go back and get some more practice? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go here. We'll go here in the middle first. We've neglected the middle a little bit. Go ahead, uh, sir. The gentleman with the microphone is fine, please. Again, th thank you for your service. Could you tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit about the sacrifices made by the Chinese people to s secure your safety? Sure. Uh, the, the Chinese... For, for our crew... Uh, the Chinese people treated us royally uh, when they found out who we were. Uh, in Colonel Doolittle's uh, situation, uh, he landed uh, in a rice paddy with the uh, water up to his waist, uh, and uh, uh, he got out of the rice paddy and started uh, looking around. Uh, he saw a, a light in a house and went and locked on the door, and the light went out. Uh, he then uh, found another place, and uh, it was dark. He went in and uh, was feeling around in the dark, and he found this thing that was like a big box. Uh, and so he climbed into that thing and uh, had proceeded to try to sleep. Uh, the next morning, uh, when he woke up, if he did sleep, he found that he had entered a undertaker's uh, thing and he was sleeping, <laughs> sleeping in a box, a casket box. <laughs> uh, the, by that time, Chinese uh, people around had circled around, and uh, uh, there was a m Chinese major that uh, became curious and didn't believe the story that he had bailed out of an airplane and landed there. Uh, uh, and uh, he had Colonel Doolittle at gunpoint, uh, his soldiers, major soldiers, searched the house and they couldn't find the parachute. And, uh, Colonel Doolittle had told them that he they used. And uh, it was getting a little bit anxious then when one of the soldiers uh, went into the house and up in the attic found the parachute. And then uh, the the uh, major believed him, and, and he made arrangements for us to be picked up uh, by some other Jap or Chinese crew, and we were taken to a place where they had a telephone. Uh, and Colonel Doolittle spent a couple of days using that telephone, <coughs> trying to find out where everybody was and what kind of condition there was. And, uh, uh, from then on, uh, we were uh, transported uh, by about every means of transportation, water, donkeys, cars, buses, uh, rickshaws, and seating chairs, and uh, we finally got to a place where we were put aboard a riverboat that was patrolled by the uh, Japanese. And for some reason, we weren't challenged and were able to make it downstream in one uh, river and upstream in another and finally got to a place called uh, Henyang where they had an air, uh, AVG flight of three P-40s. And uh, with their radio equipment, uh, they were able to call a a 10th Air Force in India, and they sent a C-47 in and picked us up and took us to Chongqing, which was the uh, provisional capital at that time. 
General uh, Chiang Kai-shek told President Roosevelt that 250,000 uh, Chinese were murdered by the Japanese in retaliation for the raid. We have another question, yeah. I have two questions, please. Uh, first question is for the pilots. Did you take turns flying the aircraft uh, from the takeoff from the carrier and then the strike uh, on Japan? Uh, the second question, which was better, Navy Chow or Army Chow? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hear what he said. Uh, well, he wonders uh, during the flight for the pilots and the co-pilots if you switched off uh, flying duties and uh, who had the better food, the Army or the Navy? Yeah. Uh, in our airplane, um, the air, the bombing site, the Nording bombing site, which we took out because we were going low level, uh, was hooked up to the automatic pilot. So. We had no autopilot pilots, so we switched off and had the manhandle uh, thing all the way to China. And uh, we flew between two and 300 feet on the whole trip, except for the bombing run. Hand flying. Colonel, uh, what was your sensation when you got that visual fix on that Japanese sh shoreline, and what did you and General Doolittle uh, say to each other when you got that visual fix and first saw that shoreline of Japan? Uh, actually, he, we didn't say anything to each other, uh, but I was very uh, impressed by the beauty of the place. It was all uh, nice and green and uh, cultured very well. And, uh, uh, the uh, only thing that uh, kind of marred up the, the was, uh, I wonder what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and a question. To your right, gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, my question is about how the Army was selected to do this mission over the Navy and the Marine pilots and their aircraft, and was there any rift or protest or concern after the mission that the Navy and the Marines weren't selected for this mission? I, never I think we had the only airplane that had a chance of doing this mission. I, I doubt if the Navy had airplanes that could do it without getting too close to Japan. The Japanese thought we would have to get within 200 miles of uh, Japan so that we could ma make it back to the carrier. So I, I think our airplane was chosen because it was the best airplane for the job that anybody had. Yeah, General Doolittle determined that that was the only plane that could fulfill the mission and it was an Army plane. Another, another question? Gentlemen, it truly is an honor to be in your company tonight and share this opportunity to ask questions and hear your answers. You've been given extraordinary opportunities in your life. Even when you volunteered, you didn't know what you were getting into. Tremendous challenges and trials personally. And now you're, you're still looking back over all those years and telling your stories. I'm curious, what wisdom what counsel, what words would you want to pass on just from all that you've experienced, all that you've witnessed? That's what I want to hear from you. Did you hear? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have <clears throat> spoken to a number of high school classes about our mission, and sometimes the students would say, uh, what do you recommend for us? I said, well, you can do what I did. Uh, I found something I really wanted to do. I was fascinated by airplanes, and I worked hard at it and had a good career. So if you find something you think you want to do, try to get a job in that area and, and really work at it, and you'll probably be okay. That was my advice to him. It worked for me. <laughs> yeah. Have time for more questions? Okay. The B-25 crew that landed in Vladivostok, how exactly did it escape Russia and Iran back, back a stateside? And again, thank you for your service. 
wondering about the plane that landed in Vladivostok and how the guys all got back. Would any of you like to answer? You wouldn't take it? Yeah. One plane went to Vladivostok. They got over Japan and decided the, uh, their gas supply was so low they couldn't possibly reach their destination in China. So they turned right and went two, three hundred miles up to Vladivostok and landed. At that time, uh, the Russians, of course, were our allies. And at that time also, the Russians were having a very difficult time with the Germans on the, on the Western Front. And so what they did, they uh, simply put our crew on hold there for almost a year. And at the end of that time, our crew showed up in, in uh, Russia, in the Russian part of Russia, and uh, were turned over to the Allies. But uh, they held them for that whole year. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question on that? They, they, were in, they were interned and, and moved to different, uh, mostly houses that they were imprisoned in. And one of them happened to be near the border of Iran, and they were able to hire a border smuggler to get them across. So. At the risk of being repetitious, I also want to thank you very much for your service. My question is, when you departed on your mission, did you have a formal plan for extraction or for getting out, or was it just kind of like, do the best you can? We had several plans, and we had one that could have worked, but we were supposed to take off in the evening, bomb during the night, and land in a, a base in China that had some gas. As it turned out, though, we had to take off several hundred miles too soon, so that plan couldn't be used. I don't. So the plan we used was kind of the worst case scenario, and that's what we did. But the, our plan that we had initially could well have worked out okay. Would not, no sense, but it, it could have. But we didn't get to use it, and that's how that came about, yeah. We have time for three more questions. Did someone have the microphone already? Okay. Is this thing working? Just, uh, in the bow tie, I guess. In the bow tie, sir? In the, in the very back, please, with the microphone, sir. You've got the mic. Okay. Uh, at that time, I understand that they had a device called JATO's Jet Assisted Takeoffs. Did you fellas use anything like that to get off the carriers? Did you guys use uh, jet assisted takeoff no. uh, no. on the airplane or did you want to? What is it again? JATO? It wasn't even invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, not only did they not use that, um, what, uh, a fact that some people don't know is that every plane had the exact same takeoff role. They all moved up to a certain line and uh, so even the planes that, that were stored at the very back tail end of the carrier, they still took off in the, the same distance as plane number one. We did the best that Mother uh, Nature could give us. <laughs> That's right. No. I lied. We have more than three more questions. Okay. I've, uh, I've read that uh, Colonel Doolittle was fairly despondent when you folks landed in China and, in fact, thought he might, in fact, be court-martialed. Uh, any truth to that? So um, he's asking about the veracity of, of uh, General Doolittle fearing that he would be court-martialed for what happened on the raid. Well, that, that was just his immediate response to having mm -hmm. lost his plane and, and uh, his crew were just mm -hmm. sitting there. And so he was very despondent about how it had ended up. But of course, it all came out in the war where he got a great accolade. He got back to the United States and was promoted to Brigadier General. And uh, he did all right, as you know, from that time <laughs> on. <laughs> it's w w one of our finest uh, generals in World War II and an outstanding aviator and man. To your left, gentlemen. Hi. Um, 
I want to tell you the same thing I tell my husband, which is thank you for making the world safe for me to be born into. I really appreciate that. But I have a question that's more of a personal nature. Um, and that is, I wonder if any of you men were married at the time you were in the service. And if so, were there any special efforts made to let your wives know that you were well? Were any of us married? I got it. <laughs> I wasn't married. When, when, you when General uh, Doolittle uh, uh, returned to the back stage, back. Uh, he oh, personally see. wrote a letter to the family of each crew member telling them what uh, condition their relation was uh, of the individuals. Uh, he also uh, uh, came home, when he came home, he went with several of the crew members that came home with him uh, on uh, bond tours. They went around the country uh, selling bonds. I don't think any of us were married at the time. To your right, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I'm humbled to be in your presence. Um, I and my generation are certainly beneficiaries and inheritors of, uh, uh, of the service uh, and the best uh, that America had to offer that you personify uh, of your generation. And so I, I thank you again. I'm interested if if one of you could comment upon the experience of bailing uh, and jumping out of uh, out of the plane, uh, I have read that uh, none of you had done that before. Uh, is that is that accurate? Yes. yes I <laughs> Since that was your first time in uh, in doing that, Major, can you give us uh, some idea of? Uh, how it felt to look down into that hole and uh, over the darkness and know that you were going to do something that you hadn't done before and 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 what if if any thoughts were running through your mind about what to expect well the, the tech order on how to get out of the airplane uh, stated that you should face the front of the airplane and roll out through the the exit it also said that you should say 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 before you pull the ripcord. But uh, I think everybody said 3,000. <laughs> now we really do have only time for three more questions, and I've got. <laughs> I've got two of them assigned already, so Molly gets one. Thank you, folks, for uh, serving our country and for being here today and et cetera. You mentioned that you didn't get to follow your plan, and that leads me to my question. Um, actually, you did more than your plan. The improvision that you did and the survival that you did strictly amazes me because had you not been successful in your improvision, and you'd all been captured and paraded through Tokyo on top of all the bad news we had up until that time, I mean, you folks did one heck of a job. Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, you were captured by the Germans. Did they know that you were one of the Doolittle Raiders? And if so, what was their reaction? Well, uh, in, in the interrogation uh, up in Germany, when I went into the interrogation room, and no other prisoner ever had the same experience that I heard of, there were four German generals sitting there listening to this in, a professional interrogator who interrogated all the prisoners who came through. They didn't have anything to say, but they were very interested in everything I had to say. And uh, he questioned me for quite a while. And uh, part of his question would be, uh, what's happening here? And uh, 
Italy and that, and I just simply say, well, I was never in Italy, of course, and I had to lie to them big time, because I, I realized they were trying to get some kind of information out of me, which I didn't want to give them, and I wasn't quite sure what, uh, exactly what it was. But uh, that's the only different treatment that I ever had. It was when I was first brought into the uh, big interrogation base up in, uh, in Germany. And uh, I went pretty fast from there over to the prison camp. And they, they never treated me any differently. They did throw me in the uh, cooler one time for a couple of weeks because we had pulled the wall of my room. I had a roommate at the end of a building that I was in charge of there, and we pulled the, the uh, wall in on one side, and we had maps and American money and civilian clothes and all these things in there for all kinds of escape material. And we had people from time to time trying to get out. And uh, they finally figured out that my room wasn't quite long enough. So <laughs> they, they ran me out. And uh, sure enough, they pulled that wall down. And they sent me to the cooler for two weeks for destruction of right property. <laughs> and I, I said to this German colonel, I improved that room. You got a real nice closet in there now. <laughs> they, 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 they didn't have much of a sense of humor, I can tell you that. Tom was also specially trained to receive um, secret messages from the U.S. government while he was in the POW camps. Right, Tom? You were also trained to receive receive the secret messages. You want to tell him about that? What, what was that? The secret messages that came to you in the in the camp. Oh, well, it came to several. Yeah, well, a certain number of Air Force men, and this was a good move, I don't know what proportion, got messages that they could use if they became prisoners of war. In other words, uh, let's say you got a mes message to carry with you to remember. Your Aunt Tilly from Kokomo was writing to you, and in there you, it was the, uh, the message that she really wanted to tell you. And then you got one of her letters, and you wrote back for, to your, own, your Aunt Tilly in Kokomo, and hope that this got all through the German. They read all the mail that came in, of course, and all that went out. And we had people, I don't know how many people, with these kind of addresses that were constantly in, in communicate with people here in the States with these kind of messages. And uh, the people that had them, of course, had to keep quiet about what they had and just use them accordingly. It was a good idea and well done. Uh, well, I guess uh, the man who holds the mic gets the last question. Um, I'd like to ask you, what do you want? You mentioned that you speak to high school groups. Uh, what do you want this group to get out of what you all did some nearly 70 years ago? And what's the message that we can carry on? Well, <clears throat> we just want to tell people about World War II and, and people like to hear it from somebody who was there and uh, that's one of the main things that we accomplished is bringing that truth to whoever wanted to listen. All right, well the Raiders will be available for autographs and some more questions uh, after this. I've got just a short closing. Um, the writers have been getting together almost every year uh, to see each other again, almost every year since the raid. And next April 17th through the 20th, they'll be getting together for the 71st time since the raid. And this will be uh, at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. It's an event that will be open to the public. And uh, this year, we'll, they'll also have some members of the Chinese government in attendance, some Chinese survivors of the war who helped the raiders some Hornet crew members, survivors, and we're hoping to have 25 B-25s. 
on the closed runway at the National Museum of the United States Air Force and, uh, and a formation flyover after that. So, <laughs> Dayton, Ohio, the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I'll be seeing a lot of you there. So. <laughs>